Let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everybody. Uh, remodeling antique plumbing with modern tools. Uh, I work at a university. We have a lot of old plumbing. This is web development at the trailing edge. My name is Dustin Yance. I'll say that again, Dustin Yance. Um, I work at the University of Texas Libraries, and I have the amazing title of webmaster. That's how you know. What's that? Mm -hmm. That's how you know how old our plumbing is. They still need webmasters. Uh, you might recognize me from my avatar. I've been using this guy far too long. Um, and I, Websites keep getting higher and higher res, and my avatar just keeps getting lower and lower res. Uh, he started off as an aim icon. Um, so first off, this is not a danger zone. This is a judgment-free zone. Um, we all have to deal with this kind of stuff from time to time. Uh, as the websites sit out there on servers, they start to accumulate cruft and kipple. Um, so we all have to deal with this. We all have that, that one hack that we did that one time just to get something out the door. But this is how we kind of try to deal with that using modern tools. Um, so how many of you remember these? These are spacer GIFs. They were a lot of fun. Um, this is a website, uh, kina.org. Um, it's an Irish word. I can always pronounce it wrong. Um, this, the, the lady that did this, uh, Emma Story, she's a developer in New York. She was one of the first web people that I started following. Um, this is her website circa 2001. You can tell that if you turn the borders on. And you can see that she turned the, the border ta table borders on. Um, this is how I learned how to do web development. Like, this is amazing. You can take a picture, slice it up, and put it back together. And you don't have to use image maps. Those are always kind of weird. Um, so to me, this was the greatest thing. Believe it or not, there's still websites out there like this. And you might have to deal with some of those. Hopefully not, but maybe you will. This is my baby. This is what I spend every day on. This is the University of Texas Library website. Um, it is, I don't know, I should someday actually count it up. It's maybe 60% Drupal uh, and 40% custom HTML, CSS, PHP, lots of things. Um, the Drupal is Drupal 6. Luckily, as, as far as I know, we don't have any Drupal 5 kicking around anymore. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. Um, we have a pretty cool uh, proxy server set up. So you go to www.lib, and that points to any number of different servers running the different technologies. And that's kind of nice. It lets us do things like stage things in advance if we need to. Uh, right now, I'm working on a Drupal 7 site, and that's living at a Drupal 7 subdomain. But nobody can see it until we punch the holes through the proxy and let the public in. So it's kind of a nice thing. Um, this is the directory I deal with every single day. Um, this is our, our lib-home package, all of the, the home files. Um, there's a lot of files. <laughs> Like a lot of files. Uh, try out my new toy here. Um, so you see all of those footers, all of these headers, some surrounds, um, a lot of jQuery stuff. We have a lot of duplicated stuff, a lot of replicated stuff. Um, and it's also duplicated on the Drupal server. Um, all of this then lives inside of this. So if you need to edit something, there's three, four places you have to go. Um, Anybody use that backup system, dot back? Uh, come down to the bottom. Uh, this is the fun part. This is the CSS for the website. Um, so we have utlol.css, um, utlol-second-comp, not sure what that is, dash comp-2 dash underscore 1. Is that University of Texas <laughs> Libraries online, but yes. Uh, I do giggle every time I get to type that into an admin page. Um, but yeah, so we got, we got all these guys down here. Um, these are all in use in different places. Uh, we don't have complete control over, especially a lot of the HTML sites. We have you know, like branches like the Fine Arts Library. They have their own web guy. Um, he uses our stuff. I don't necessarily know what he's using. Um, because of this. 
I can't collapse these into a single file because I don't know what's in use. Um, so yeah, you have, to, you have to think of a way to deal with some of this rather than having to go in. Uh, you know, if you need to change, we had to change the link colors on the front page um, to a nice aquamarine because we added an aquamarine search box. So we wanted to kind of tie the page together a little bit. So we had to change it in all of these different places. That's not a lot of fun. Yes. Oh, we'll get there. Um, so this guy, the best is the enemy of the good. There's always a better way to do something. There's always that golden ideal. Sometimes you just got to do it. So like that front page, I don't necessarily know who is using what CSS file. Um, so I could always do something like this. <laughs> and just wait and see, you know, who calls me? And then I know, oh, that's who was using that CSS file. Um, you know, it's kind of the, I guess, the, the more negative, destructive way of doing things. Um, you kind of make some enemies sometimes when you do things like that. Um, but here's the thing. We're lucky in that at least all of our servers um, are not IIS, because I have no idea how we do a lot of these things on there. Um, instead, it's Unix. We know this. We can figure out cool stuff to do. So don't forget your Unix basics. Um, what are you doing? There we go. Yeah, so don't forget your, your things. So uh, I've got all those files. Like, I think it's six total that I would have to go through and make changes in. Um, so what if I found a way to just go through and normalize those? And maybe they're not all going to be exactly what they used to be, uh, because we, have, we even have some different HTML structures, like our menus. Some of them use H2s as the, the master link. Some of them use H3s. I don't know why that was. I would like to change just one and not the other. So I can go through and I can normalize things with symlinks. So go through, find the things that are the same, find the things that are different, and then kind of mush them together until you have one pretty good file that looks good. Um, and then do some hard links. Uh, I hadn't used hard links in a long time because I, I remember having trouble with hard links. And they, you have to be careful with hard links. It's a little bit different than a, a soft link. The nice thing about hard links is you can have multiple files pointing back to a single file. So you can have those six files point at one master file. All of their content is going to be identical. If you make a change in any one of those, or if somebody else comes behind you and makes a change in any one of those, it's going to change them across the board. So that's pretty good. Um, use version control. Who here is using version control? That's everybody. Awesome. OK. So I don't have to beat it into your heads too hard. But again, it's one of those things. It's really easy to want to have the, the perfect, ideal version control system and then ignore version control until you can accomplish that. Um, but you know, let's make it work. Uh, when I, I've been at the libraries for a year now. Uh, and about two months in, I realized we had no version control. And so I asked my boss, oh, what do you think about using Git? You know, it's, it's a thing. People use it. Maybe we should start using it. He's like, oh, OK. Well, I mean, I'll look into I'll talk to my boss. I'll send this email. And I was like, OK, cool. And while he went off and did that, I just started using Git. Um, because, you know, the gears are going to turn. But in the meantime, I've got something that, you know, is starting to turn into something. Um, I, I've got a little bit of a, of a security blanket there, and that's nice. Um, I was going to beat it into people's heads, but use version control. No, seriously, use version control. Um, and again, it, it, we don't have to get into religious war. Um, you can use SVN, I guess. Um, you can use Git. You can use Mercurial. You can use Fossil. Um, I think those are the only ones that I could think of. Um, CVS, it, it doesn't, you know, like, pick, pick something. Pick something that works for you. Um, don't use CVS. <laughs> Uh, the, the nice thing about Git, uh, yes. See, you say that. <laughs> but then you get into the, the dot back version 2, version 2 dash 1. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Git is nice, not because it's a better piece of software. I've heard plenty of arguments in both directions. Git is nice because it has a community around it. Um, so Drupal has standardized on Git. A lot of other people have standardized on Git. So that means that there's a lot of help out there. There's a lot of examples that you can use. 
Um, and that's super nice. Um, what do we have here? Yeah, SVN, Git, Mercurial, Fossil, any of those. So again, that is not version control. Those are versions, that is not version control. Um, you, might, you might notice something if you spend a lot of time in a terminal. Um, there's no color on this screen. There's no, there's no color output at the university. Uh, we are currently running Solera servers. Solera servers do not have color on the terminal uh, compiled in by default. Um, it is kind of a pain to get that compiled in. So we make do with what we have. Um, that's not the only problem. So Solaris, Solaris isn't a bad thing. Uh, it just has some baggage. Um, Solaris has uh, been having some discussions about this. The way we use it, we don't have group permissioning. And what I've heard is that one of the problems, there is a hard limit of 16 groups that an individual user account can be joined into. We have a lot of directories that we would want to consider groups, like 30, 40, 50 minimum. So we'd have to do some weird like glomming together or something to make that kind of work. We just don't do that. Um, and that makes things a little bit tricky. This guy up here, um, that's the wrong image. Um, that's the user account that a few of us use. I did not realize when I first started, and uh, I, I made a couple of messes for other people that I had to go back and clean up, because uh, I presumed I was logging into my shell account um, to do things. Not exactly the case. Um, so one of the, the bigger problems with this is you don't know who did what to what file. You know that something happened to a file. You probably know when it happened, but you don't know who very easily. Um, and that's not a bad thing, but it can be problematic. Maybe, you know, not, we're not even talking about malicious things. We're just talking about who did this thing? Why did they do it? Maybe there was a good reason at the time. Maybe it's a thing that I can fix, but I don't know. Maybe I'm going to break something. These are things that we don't really know. Um, you can version control the client side, your desktop, as well as the server side. And this is the, the kind of the workaround I've come up with that's working pretty well so far. Um, now, I know nobody in this room does this, but every once in a while, certain people who will call cowboys like to log into production servers and make edits directly on there to fix that one little thing that just takes one minute and it's not a big deal. But now, that is out of sync with what you have on your desktop. It's out of sync with what other people have. Um, if, if you're doing, we have load balance servers, maybe that other server doesn't pick up that change either right away or ever. Um, there's lots of weird things that can happen there. So you want to kind of deal with the potential damage of the cowboy coders. Uh, and one easy way to do that is by putting version control on the server side. So you don't, again, you don't have to put like, oh, so we, we, do, we dump it into this thing and it fires off a post commit hook and then that goes to this thing and this thing and then is rolled out to production incrementally um, with com you know, the, the perfect continuous integration testing stack. Um, sometimes you just go into the thing that you need to work on. Like I do a lot of Drupal themes. So each theme, I make a Git repository. And it's a repo on my desktop, it's a repo on the server. When I make changes, I just go over to the server and do a Git pull. And then the latest stuff is there. Um, I know, you know exactly what I did when I did it. I have all of my commit messages. If other people go in and edit it on the server, I can roll up a commit from the server push it back to GitHub, it's now in the master repository, and I can pull that back down to my desktop. Um, and that is super nice. And there's a current thing I'm doing right now where I'm working on a, a Drupal site. I don't have access to my modules, so I have to ask the sysadmin to install modules and do that for me. I do have access to the admin on the, ser on the, the site itself, and I have access to my desktop. I want to use Compass. I want to use SAS. I can't run that on the server. So I'm having to do all of my CSS changes locally, do all of my Drupal changes on the, the server that I'm working on, and then go and use GitHub as the go-between between between the two. So whenever I make CSS changes, I pull, put those up to GitHub, pull them to the server. Whenever I make changes to the Drupal thing, if I want to change like a, a TPL file, 
I have to pull that into GitHub and then pull it back down to my desktop. It's not ideal, but once you get going, it's you know, not too bad of a workflow. And you should really only be focusing on one or the other of those at a single time anyway. Uh, but you know, as, one, as a one-man shop, these are the kind of things you have to do when you don't have the full control over the server, like in a lot of universities. Um, so back to Solaris. Git expects you to have your own account on a server. Like that's just the assumption that it makes. Um, so it does things, uh, it uses SSH keys for authentication. SSH keys need to live inside of your directory. If you're using a shared directory, a shared account, should you put your SSH keys into that account? No. No. And again, we're not talking about malicious things. We could be, but we're not. We're just talking about somebody else doing a thing, and it, just the misattribution of a thing is almost as bad as if they did something directly malicious. Um, because it's like, oh, who did all of these changes that broke stuff? Wait a minute, why is my name on there? I don't understand what's going on here. Stuff gets weird. So I found this guy. This is great. Um, this is a directive you set in your SSH config file on your local machine. You put all of your SSH keys on your local machine, and then you're kind of masquerading when you're on that server as that person. So when I'm logged into that shared account on the server, GitHub knows who I am. So I can push and pull from the server without any trouble. Um, and that is super great. Um, this is still a problem, however. Uh, the actual repo, while GitHub knows who I am, the repo doesn't know who is doing what. So you have to come up with a way to tell the local repo who is working on it at a given time. Um, and there's no real automated way to do that. Um, so I've just been going in and typing in this command at the command line when I get into a repo that doesn't know who I am. Um, it's a little bit of a bummer. And I was thinking, you know, this is good enough. But then I was looking over my slides yesterday, and as I was thinking this through, I actually thought of two really cool ways you could probably do this. Um, so there, uh, convention versus code. The, the, the two main ways you can fix a technological problem is either come up with some piece of code that does all this cool automated stuff, or you can just make a rule. Like, hey guys, when you do this thing, this is how you do it. So if we do it as a convention, you can borrow a trick from shared corporate Twitter accounts, and you can identify yourself in the commit message. Um, so you know, you're on the server, you're doing do, 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 and then you make your commit message. And you just, at the end, just tag on your initials. That way, when people are looking at the repo later, they know who all of those different things are. Um, so you've got a history of what's going on. Um, there's another thing I was thinking about um, that I think is probably too, con too much work um, for what it is, where you would make a script. Um, and that script would, maybe you have a set of uh, config files, so dot .git config dot .dustin, dot .git config dot .mini. And you would have this script, and you say, you're on the server, and you say, run the script, take credit. It would ask you what your number is. So you just know, like, oh, I'm number six. And it'd say, hey, welcome, number six. And it would, on the fly, swap out those config files. Um, and that way, you could also, if, you know, like, I have very particular ways that I like to do things, um, shortcuts and whatnot. So that way, I could have my shortcuts on the server without screwing up other people's workflows. Yes? We try. <laughs> that too. Yes. So you could make your take credit script run in your dot login, mm -hmm. and you could make it use your SSH forwarded keys inside which get it in. Even better. I like that. I like that. Um, 
it hasn't been pushback so much as just sedentariness. Like these are the way things have been done for a very long time. Um, so people are just resistant to change. Uh, it's gotten like literally in the last year. There was I think you know there was kind of the dark times, uh, 2008, 2009. Uh, you know budgets are getting slashed. Like it was a bad deal to be on a on a university campus around then. Um, and you know like a lot of positions went fallow. Uh, you know, fallow? I think that's the other way around. Um, a lot of you know a lot of positions were empty, um, and so things just kind of cruised along, and people were just doing what they always did because there wasn't enough manpower to make any changes. Uh, last couple of years, we've started getting some fresh blood in, uh, and we're starting to make these these moves in the correct direction. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there is even I, I've heard a rumor of a pie-eyed theory that maybe just maybe we'll be using Linux sometime soon. Which you know, I would take care of some of these problems. Not, yeah, probably not all, but some of them. Um, let's see. So you're using you're using version control. Awesome. Um, me, I'm a command line guy. Uh, I, I just find it yeah, you know, it makes a little bit more sense. And the Git clients that I've tried, they're just uh, they don't do it for me. Um, I think they're made for designers, and it's nothing against designers. It's just not how I think. Um, and some of the commands, even to me, can be kind of obtuse. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be hard. This slide got duplicated. So this, if you commit, you're going to make a commit and you add a file and you're like, oh, I need to take that file back because that's not part of this one specific commit message or I'm not done with it, whatever it is. This is the command you have to use to reset that thing. I have had to look this up. I don't know, every single time I've had to use it. Um, sometimes I forget that it's a double dash. Sometimes I forget the caret at the end. Um, you know, not the most user-friendly thing in the world. Um, to get back to GitHub, one of the greatest single things I found on GitHub is dot .files. Uh, I don't know if you guys know about it. Dot .files is just one of those conventions where people have started sharing their personal collections of dot .files. Um, originally, I was a film guy. I, I got a film degree. I went to work for film companies. I made movies. Uh, I was an editor mostly. I did a little bit of sound work. One of the things I found in film that I don't necessarily see in computer stuff, and something that was being talked about in the keynote, um, is the idea of workflow and workflow being passed down through the generations. Um, so if you are a film editor, you can literally make a living, a very, very comfortable living, being the guy who knows how to go from the camera to the screen. You never touch anything, you just tell other people how to do stuff. Like that is a job you can have, you're, you're a workflow consultant, and you can make $100,000, $200,000 a year easy. Um, and I think, you know, we, there, there's always new stuff um, in computers, but the general workflows, you know, we kind of throw them out a little too often. Um, and I think dot .files is kind of a good step in the direction of apprenticeship. And it's kind of a virtual apprenticeship, it's not a true apprenticeship. But you can say, oh hey, this guy or this lady, I've seen their code, I've seen what they can do, it's super awesome. What are some of the tricks that they use? Um, so I started digging through uh, all of these, I've probably looked at 30 of them to put together what I have. And it's just kind of a, a rough assemblage of what I would like it to be one day. And I just realized I have to stop. I could literally work on my dot .files 40 hours a week for like three months. I really shouldn't shave that many yaks. Uh, but one of the things I found, git uh, aliases that you can set up in your git config. So now I can say uncommit equals this command. So when I do the wrong thing, I can just say, oh, uncommit that file. And then it's like, oh, okay, cool. We're just going to ignore that for a while. Um, I've, there's, I set up one to assume that a file has changes and we don't care about it. So I can say git assume a file. So when I'm working in SAS, I can assume the style sheets directory because that's all the compiled CSS. And I don't want to commit that every single time that I'm committing something. I just want to worry about the SAS files. So I can assume that directory. There's another command for a very long command that uh, shows me the assumed files so I know what has been assumed. So when I go to commit something and that file isn't showing up on the other end, I know why. And then I can unassume things for when I do actually want to commit those. 
Um, and it's all through sweet little git aliases. And they just make life a lot easier. Instead of saying git commit dash m, I just say git c in my message. You know, it's little things like that that make your life a lot easier. Um, let's see. So, you probably recognize some of these. Doctype. Uh, it's XHTML1. Uh, HTML401. There's a thing I ran into a little while ago. This is one of those things, if you haven't been doing web stuff long enough, sometimes you don't know these things ever. And if you've been doing it too long, some of these things just kind of fell off the other end of your memory. Um, we had a product, uh, a journal subscription doohickey, that we needed to integrate uh, into our system. And we decided to give it the namespace of 360 link. Um, so its directory was going to be 360 link. The IDs and the classes, whatever we're going to use, should just be called 360 link. So it's super identifiable. Um, I ran into a problem. That didn't work. That didn't work. But that worked. It was very confusing to me. Um, and so, you know, you go to the internet and you get angry and you do this on your keyboard and the Google gives you an answer. As it turns out, um, XHTML and HTML4, names and IDs are treated differently than classes. Um, an ID or a name has to begin with a letter, either uppercase or lowercase, and then it can have any numbers or underscores, um, periods, hyphens, colons? I've never seen a colon in an ID. But apparently, you can do that. Um, CSS classes, whatever. You know, put the number first. We don't care. Um, put the punctuation first. We don't care. Pretty easy fix. Um, make that your doc type. Not always possible, though. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Internet Explorer. Um, but it does some real weird things with doc type decorations. And if the doc type doesn't match something down here, it just destroys your entire page and goes into like quirks mode or compatibility mode, and you don't know why. Um, and then your CSS isn't working, and JavaScript starts farting out the back end. It's very weird. Um, so I, this is the solution. Um, I don't have a better alternative. It's just something to keep in mind, that IDs and names have to start with the letter. I don't know why. This. This number right here is the reason I started writing this talk like three or four months ago. This was the, the seed. Does anybody know the, uh, the significance of the number 31? What's that? <laughs> uh, it is also, if you're working in less than or equal to IE9, the total number of style sheets that Internet Explorer will acknowledge. Now here's the thing, if you have 32 style sheets, it doesn't give you an error message. It's just like, what? No, I got 31, we're cool, let's go. Uh, can you imagine like, being a bus driver on a school field trip? You have 32 kids, and you just leave one behind? <laughs> come on, come on, at least, at least something. Four thousand and ninety five. Uh, and it has a file, a file size limit of 288 kilobytes. I know these numbers. I looked these numbers up. Limit of 31. Uh, so I found this out. I was working on a, a module, um, and everything was great. I had CSS aggregation turned off because I was working on a module. I was doing CSS work. I needed to see my real files. Um, everything was great until I added a print style sheet. And that print style sheet was number 32, and it wouldn't pick it up. And I nearly threw my computer out a window. Not the monitor, the computer. I know what to get angry at. I found this guy. It's a module, IE CSS Optimizer. It's on, uh, it works on Drupal 6. You don't really have this problem on Drupal 7. They've got way better CSS loading. Uh, but in Drupal 6, you use this module. You tell it what you want it to leave alone. And then it aggregates the rest into one file and then gives you whatever your files are as individual files. So you can deal with your CSS in a normal, sane fashion. Um, 495 CSS rules in a single CSS file. Um, I guess if you had more than that, you would just split it up into multiple files. 
Um, limit of 288K in a single file, I guess you would just split it up. Uh, I don't really know any other workarounds for that. Um, there are no fancy modules that take care of that. Um, but hopefully, you know, uh, as far as I know, in, IE, in uh, Drupal 7, these aren't an issue because it's smart enough to break up the CSS into ways that dumb IE can understand. So that's great. Um, playing hide and seek. So this is a short section on just down and dirty, ugly troubleshooting, because uh, these are things that you run into sometimes. Um, the develop module, it's pretty great. Um, it lets you dump out all of your variables for when you're theming and you need to know how to get to that one certain thing. But you can't, you know, you can't always install it. Um, you know, like I don't have module access on most of the sites that I work on. So I can wait the day for the module to get installed and turned on, um, or I can figure out another way around it. Um, maybe you're working on a site for your uncle who runs an AC repair shop, and it's on GoDaddy, on shared hosting. You don't have the RAM to do develop module properly. Every time you try to turn it on, it just crashes the site. Um, so what are you going to do? It's my friend. Um, it's not pretty. It is absolutely not anything that should ever be on a production site. Uh, but once you add in these little pre-tags, it's actually a pretty readable output. You know, it does the nesting. Um, I find it easier to search through uh, because the develop output hides stuff. So you have to go through and open up every single uh, fan fold before you can control F through your, your output. Uh, that's kind of annoying. So this is pretty great for that. Um, Everyone documents their websites, right? Like, as you're working, you're also, you got a, a document over here, and you've got every, oh, you, this is here, and this is here, and you have semantic names for everything, so if somebody comes behind you, it's super easy to figure out, right? Um, but, you know, sometimes you have to work on somebody else's site. Uh, and again, you know, I do this. Nobody documents everything. We're only human. We've got to get stuff done. We've got to get to happy hour. Um, I was working on our Drupal 6 site. There was a little featured uh, item on one of our branch pages. And it was you know, a title and an image. And it was just used to promote one of their collections. And something had changed. They needed to swap out that image. I think they had like an event coming up. They wanted to put in an event-specific image. I was like, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. Like, that's easy. Um, it's, oh, it's on Drupal, of course. Yeah, I'll just go right in. It won't be a problem. Um, three hours later. Uh, so what happened was, you see it, and you're like, oh, okay, that's a thing. Uh, I see the title. Um, it's got to be a content type for this little feature box. So I'll go look through the content list for that content type. Uh, there's not a content type for that. Okay, I'll look up the view. Um, so I inspect the block. I find the view number, and I go directly to that view. It's just a page that has a title and an image in it. And there's some weird like taxonomy and you know, like uh, access control and all kinds of weird stuff going on to filter this one thing to show up in this one box on the front page of this one page. Near as I can tell, it's not in use anywhere else. Now, I found it. I know how it's being generated. I still can't get to that content because we have you know, tens of thousands of nodes at this point. Um, how am I going to, and I don't have database access, so I can't just go into PHP my admin and do a quick search. That would be the easy way. Um, so I came up with this little trick. In your view, you can output the NID ID. How amazing is that? So you output this, you quickly go to the page, you find out what the, the ID number is, and then you take this off so that real people don't see it. Um, and then you're able to get into the edit form for that node and actually change the image. And it's three hours later, and you really need to go to happy hour. Um, so I, I guess like the, the theme of this talk is technical debt. Um, we all have it. We all incur it. I saw this, uh, I guess it was two months ago. I thought it was a pretty cool concept. We all talk about how evil technical debt is. But you just have to remember, technical debt is just debt. It's, you pulled out your credit card because it wasn't quite the first of the month, but there was a thing that you needed to go ahead and buy. So you swiped your credit card, you went in a little bit into debt, but you knew you were going to pay it off really quick. It's not a big deal. Sometimes it takes longer to pay that back. Um, but you know, you shouldn't, 
Just because you're doing a quick hack, you shouldn't be ashamed of that. We all have to do quick hacks. Um, this is a really cool concept I found for keeping up with your CSS technical debt. So you have your beautiful site, you deploy your beautiful site, and then real people start using it. And oh, this one link, I don't like the color of that one. Can we change that color? Um, oh, this thing, I don't really like it. Can we just like get rid of it? But it's like a complicated view thing, so you just display none it. You know, the, the quick and easy way. Use a shame file. It's a dedicated CSS file for all of your hacks. This is your ledger. This way, you don't forget all of the, the debt that you've taken on. Um, you're not taking that, that credit card and hiding it under your mattress anymore. You know what needs to be worked on. Anytime you use an important tag, for the love of God, put it in the shame.css. There has to be a better way, I promise you, if you're hi you know, hiding stuff. Uh, this came from a CSS wizardry article. It's pretty cool. Um, gratuitous picture of Lego. I added that slide today because apparently I didn't realize Drupal talks are all supposed to have Lego bricks in them. Um, so final note, it's a very, a very somber, important thing. Um, I used to work for another place at UT. I was uh, informed I could no longer work there because they ran out of money. However, they still needed work done, so I was kept on contract retainer. Um, because they no longer had a dedicated webmaster, yeah, I still had that title back then, um, they decided, oh, we probably should move from Rackspace cloud hosting to Rackspace managed cloud hosting. I said, oh, that makes total sense. Why wouldn't you do that? You know, you don't have a dedicated guy to wake up at three in the morning when the site goes down. Um, so yeah, you should absolutely, you know, it's a little bit more money a month, but it's totally great. Um, so I went through and, you know, put together a checklist for them. I moved some files around to make sure things were good. I made technical specs for the new servers so that when they migrated, everything would be smooth. And then I walked away. I was like, cool. I got an email like a month later, everything's migrated, everything went smooth. Thanks. I was like, okay, cool. Then, like two months later, unrelated issue, they call me, hey, we need you to work on this thing. Okay, cool. I logged into the managed hosting dashboard for the first time. Um, back up your files, everything, seriously. I don't know why, in Rackspace cloud hosting, maybe it's changed by now, in cloud hosting, backup was one of the major tabs. It w they already had, I think, a weekly backup set up for you. You could go in and do a daily or an hourly, whatever you wanted. Super simple, super easy. Managed hosting? Number one, it's very hard to find the backup control panel, or at least it was. Um, it looked different, which I didn't understand. Like, it was a way uglier interface for what I presumed was the same product. It apparently wasn't. Um, but most importantly, they didn't have backups turned on on any of their servers for the past three months. They were just flying blind while paying, a, I think it was an extra 150 a month for the managed hosting. And Rackspace never once thought, oh, hey, maybe we should turn on backups. So double check your backups. <laughs> Make sure they're running. Um, also know what a backup is. <laughs> I think this is something that kind of people gloss over sometimes. Just making a copy of something is not a backup. I could print out the entire library website on paper, and I could have a stack of paper this high. And I would have all of the content backed up. And if worse comes to worse, I would have this stack of content. But I can't really recover from that. And the definition of a backup in software should be disaster recovery. Because, you know, I guess I could get a bunch of student workers and sit them down and have them start typing in every single page by hand, um, but you're probably going to have a mutiny on your hands real quick, because that would just be miserable. Um, I'm saying this as things close to it have happened. Very, very close. Um, so yeah, you know, practice every, what's that? We absolutely should. Um, so yeah, you know, practice. Have a disaster recovery test. Um, if you're on Rackspace, it's super easy. Take whatever backup you have, try to spin up another server using that same backup. Um, 
something like that, just so you have a proof of concept that the thing that you backed up is actually recoverable. Um, because as they say, it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. Also, you're not paranoid if they're really out to get you. Those are the lessons I learned from my grandmother. That's me. Questions? Excellent. Well then, thank you all very much. It was a lot of fun. Uh, glad you can make it here on the, uh, the last panel of the last day. Uh, have a good Sunday.